services. She earned her MFA in communication design from Louisiana Tech University. Hawkins is an associate professor of communication arts at Centenary College and serves as the chair of the art and visual culture department. We are so excited to have her tonight to discuss her sabbatical um, artwork that she made for Simulacrum here in our project space gallery. It will be up through December 2nd along um, and, and past that for a few different holiday events that we have going on here at the Meadows. So please welcome Jessica. All right, so first of all, this is way different than conference presentations where there are like six people. So I'm really <laughs> glad that you all are here and thank you so much for coming out this afternoon. Uh, so this is a story about how, and that sounds a lot like fresh print, so I'm gonna restart. <laughs> so. <laughs> This is a story about how to simplify learning one new thing, screen printing. Um, I decided to try another new thing, AI imagery, and clearly I'm very bad at simplifying. So, um, so to set expectations for our time together this afternoon, um, I just wanna say that if you're here looking for a hot take on artificial intelligence that you can then engage in heated debate, like this is not that, okay? Um, instead, I'm gonna take you on my own journey through skill acquisition, pragmatism, discovery, and ultimately ambivalence. This um, also is serving as my sabbatical talk, so there's definitely an element of what I did on my summer vacation. Um, so just know that that is coming as well. Uh, to better understand um, this physical digital mashup that um, I'm gonna be sharing with you, it might help to understand where I've been, right? So my past creative work focused on translating digital design processes to physical objects and installations, entailing the use of screen printing and tools like CNC routers and laser cutters. Um, and I haven't had a lot of access to those things um, here in Shreveport, right? Um, my past work also explored creative coding and generative design as a mode of artistic expression which is something that will come back into play later. Um, thus, I proposed my sabbatical to implement a brand new screen printing studio in the Turner Art Center Annex, while beginning experimentation to develop a new body of scholarly creative work. Now, while implementing the screen printing studio does serve my personal scholarly creative um, interests, it is more importantly the fruition of a long-term goal for the department. Right? Screen printing bridges the interests of our studio art students and our communication students. It builds foundational printmaking schools, tools for our um, studio artists, and they can you know, amplify their work by printing multiples of that design, of that artwork. Um, and it gets our graphic design students off the computer and connects them to physical processes that improve their problem solving skills and craftsmanship. It also promotes this designer as author ethos, right? Encouraging pathways to entrepreneurship and for students to have their own design voice. And who among us doesn't love a cool screen printed poster or t-shirt or other merch, right? So very exciting and fun for everyone. And yes, that is uh, slowly amorphously growing, yeah. Um, so the first step for me then was preparing the studio, right? So this is the, what I did on my summer vacation uh, component of today's talk. So I prepared for the project by decluttering and cleaning the space. This is the before. Um, I painted the interior white to reduce the reflective color effects of the previously yellow walls. And I coordinated with Centenary facilities to install additional power outlets and water lines. Um, I then sourced all the equipment for the studio, including a massive exposure unit, uh, backlit washout booth, screen squeegees, inks, emulsion degreaser, paper, exposure film, printer, all of that. Um, I even lined the windows with metal stripping so that I could make these magnetic window covers for a makeshift dark room. Um, and so it still looks like a lot of junk, but it's new junk and better organized junk. <laughs> okay. Um, so then the screen printing process, 
requires quite a bit of calibration, right? Um, and experimentation among a variety of materials and processes, including exposure lengths, screen mesh resolutions, uh, emulsion solutions, and ink consistency. And while I have screen printing experience, I don't have experience or didn't have experience maintaining a screen printing studio. So I pursued continuing education in the form of online classes. Um, I visited other screen printing classrooms like Louisiana Tech to better understand how to implement that as a studio classroom. So these are some images. I'm just gonna walk you briefly through the screen printing process. So, you know, for me, but not for everyone, that process of designing starts on a computer and um, then I print that design onto a film positive separation on the printer. I am cleaning and degreasing screens, rinse and let dry, that's a um, pattern we're gonna pursue. Uh, coat the screen with photoemulsion, which is a chemical that hardens and blocks the screen um, when exposed to UV light. Then you have to let that dry um, and then reclaim the emulsion. You know, then we align the film with the screen, ensuring registration among multiple separations, expose the screen and then wash out, let dry. And again, those exposure times vary. Um, and then here's a close up of the film positive that's printed out from the printer from my computer. And then once it is exposed on the emulsion and then rinsed out, you can see the film positive. So we push the ink through those um, lighter spaces in the mesh. And then again, rinsing, we tape off the screen to avoid ink getting in crevices, it shouldn't be, adjust the registration, ink the screen, um, flood the screen, and then pull the print, and then let dry, and then do it all again for the next color. Um, as a graphic designer who's used to working quickly and digitally, this process of slowing down was at first very painful, and um, those near me were, were hearing things like, I don't know that I like this. Um, but we came through. So then came the question of, you know, I've got this, the studio set up, I have um, gone through learning this process, and then it becomes what to make, right? Um, and my primary role as a graphic designer means I seldom get to ask this question, right? I'm typically solving a specific problem for a specific audience for a particular client with given constraints of timeline and budget. So that question is somewhat paralyzing. Um, thus, I decided that instead of a traditional model of where the artist designs or makes and the machine prints, I was going to try making the machine make and the artist print. Um, this approach draws on several points of inspiration. First, a desire to log a lot of time screen printing and not being on my computer, right, designing. Uh, second is um, my ethos as a graphic designer and a graphic design educator. And thirdly, um, just the general fever pitch of AI. Um, and so I'm going to tease each of those out a little bit. So first is time in the studio. Uh, so this is where the pragmatism piece comes in. I needed something to keep me spending the bulk of my time on the, com um, the bulk of my time not on the computer designing, but rather engaging in this rapid iteration to quickly hone a new skill. Um, and so the, giving me the opportunity to fail and fail and fail some more. Um, and finally get some traction, right? So this image is of me doing a split fountain where I'm doing multiple ink colors on a single screen. So that experimentation happening on the printing side rather than the designing side. Um, the second factor, point of inspiration, is this idea of a graphic design ethos. Um, in my foundational graphic design course, I actually design, uh, assign a project called Des Designer Homage Posters, which is um, basically I assign them a, an inspiration famous graphic designer and have them design a poster in that style. Um, and since graphic design is problem solving, it often calls on designers to be chameleons, Adopting, adopting styles that may not be their own personal preference, okay? So to make my case, I'm going to show you two pairs of designers that are actually in the exhibit um, to show you how even among the, each other, they are appropriating recognizable styles. So on the left, we have um, an Art Nouveau Alphonse Mucha, 
And then on the right here, we have Wes Wilson, the father of psychedelic poster design, clearly appropriating the sort of ornate frames um, that we see over in um, Mucha's work. And then also the, the feminine figure as well. Unless you think, well, at least his type is super original and authentic. From 1905, a poster um, by Alfred Roller in 1902, and you can see he pulled the, um, the text from there. And when his boss said, I mean, I like it, but like, no one's gonna read it. They can't read it. And he goes, they'll stop to read it because they can't read it. <laughs> um, so that was part of his um, aesthetic and strategy. Here's another example. Um, on the left, we have uh, Alexander Rodchenko, a Russian constructivist working just after the Russian Revolution or during the Russian Revolution. Um, and then we see Paula Scher, who is a titan in graphic design industry, still working at um, Pentagram Studio. And you can see pulling that exact same idea of the, the female head and then the, the text radiating out in this sort of graphic diagonal dynamic quality. Um, and these are just two examples of many where designers are drawing on the images of others who came before. You know, as the writer of Ecclesiastes points out, there is nothing new under the sun. And it was this premise that led me to consider how well AI might do on this same assignment. And of course, the third factor is this artificial intelligence fever pitch that's happening. So if you haven't been under a rock, you're likely aware of this paradigm shift that's happening right now around us. Uh, and so it felt like this was a natural fit for me to explore given my past um, exploration of physical and digital um, relationships and processes. You know, there are lots of artificial intelligence image generators. Um, I chose to use Midjourney. And so th these images are pretty typical of Midjourney images. They're surreal, hyper-realistic. Um, and I think it is completely reasonable and understandable for artists to be wary um, of these tools, right? Um, so I, I really was just trying to find this connection between um, this tool and how I could use it. So uh, this is the point where I'm gonna get to this a point counterpoint, right? What are the opportunities of artificial intelligence? And then we're gonna explore the pitfalls. So, you know, Take one is that the future is bright, right? AI is gonna allow us to do some really amazing things. And many would say artificial intelligence is not the first revolutionary technology decried by artists and creatives, right? So new technologies have always scared people. Uh, when the printing press was invented, scribes guilds, some destroyed the machines and chased book merchants out of town, okay? Uh, 99 years ago, John Philip Sousa predicted that recordings would lead to the demise of music. Um, the phonograph, he warned, would erode the finer instincts of the ear, end amateur playing and singing, and put professional musicians out of work. Quote, the time is coming when no one will be ready to submit himself to the ennobling discipline of learning music, he wrote. Everyone will have their ready-made or ready-pirated music in their cupboards. Something is irretrievably lost when we are no longer in the presence of bodies making music. He says, the nightingale song is delightful because the nightingale herself gives it forth. Okay. Um, then we move on to the, the camera, right? And on first seeing a photograph around 1840, the influential French painter Paul de la Roche proclaimed, from today, painting is dead. And you know, that sounds like a far-fetched claim, but it captures the anxieties that surrounded the technology when it first emerged in the mid-19th century. And of course, painting didn't die, right? Even if the medium seemed to have taken a direct hit at first. In France, for example, as photographic images spread over the years, so did Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, Cubism and Surrealism. Photography, one might argue, didn't murder painting, Rather, it shook things up by creating new options and opportunities, right? And the same was true with the introduction of the personal computer uh, and desktop publishing uh, software like Adobe Photoshop and PageMaker. 
Um, graphic artists who hand set, type, and pasted up compositions using films were decrying it was the end of their profession. But instead of an end, it was a seismic shift from one set of tools to a new set of tools. Um, so every new tool, and I'm looking at you, Canva, right, is the supposed death knell of our field. Um, amid fears that AI will supplant creative professionals, designers are exploiting a current limitation in the technology. The results are only as good as the human mind prompting the AI programs. For now, AI doesn't build it for us, it builds it with us. Even some famous artists are excited about the possibilities of AI. Uh, British pop artist Peter Blake, you might know his work for um, the Beatles, um, is one such artist. At the age of 91, Blake has been collaborating with a robot powered by AI, and he's super excited by what he calls a kind of magic. So here's a picture. Um, the robot is powered by AI to draw subjects that it takes photographs of. And um, actually, last month, Blake used AI for a, quote, performance art installation in which 300 guests were photographed upon arriving at this hotel in Hong Kong, only to realize that they had participated in the, a world first, a Blake collage created in real time. But that's not the only take, right? The other side, right, is that AI, the future, is not bright, but it is bleak, right? There are two sides to every kind, coin. Some have asserted that saying AI is just another tool. Um, but it's saying that is like maybe saying that the atom bomb is just another weapon. <laughs> um, the difference between those other inventions and AI is an order of magnitude. At an international AI safety summit last week, the US, UK, EU, Australia, and China all agreed that artificial intelligence poses a potentially catastrophic risk to humanity. In the first, and that was the first international declaration to deal with AI. Um, and the US announced at the summit that they created the American AI Safety Institute. And also last week, uh, the Biden administration released an executive order requiring US AI companies, such as AI, OpenAI and Google, to share their safety test results with the government before releasing new AI technology. Um, and the claims are that <laughs> Biden signed this executive order in the wake of watching the newest Mission Impossible 7, in which the villain is AI. <laughs> so that's hearsay, but I saw it on many news sites. So take that for what you will. Okay. All right, so you may be asking, um, how does AI work? And that question is a bit outside the scope of this presentation, um, and honestly, maybe a little bit outside my understanding. But simply what you need to know is that computers are being fed algorithms um, that are averaging billions of points of data, scraping images, captions, and alt tags, right? Um, and all of that that's found on the web. And so depending on the AI engine, some of these data sets are open. That is, we can see what's in the data set, right? And, but some are closed, and we can't see what's in them. Um, and some of these early data sets have been criticized for having bias baked in, right? Using misogynist, racist, ableist, and judgmental classificatory terms, uh, matching pictures of people to words such as alcoholic and bad person call girl or, or worse. Um, and while those data sets continue to be refined, particularly in the face of PR blowback, um, the result is still an average of all the human created data that is out there, which is rife with bias. Um, so you can see, this is, these are images from a Washington Post um, microsite that they have dedicated to bias in um, AI, so a soccer player, someone playing soccer is to them mostly someone who's male and mostly someone who's a person of color, whereas a person who's cleaning is always female and always happy about it. <laughs> Interesting, all right? Um, here we have a portrait of a person at social services, wholly people of color, 
versus a productive person, which, who is a white man in his late 20s, early 30s in a suit surrounded by paper. That's what productivity <laughs> looks like. Good to know. Um, stable diffusion, which is the engine that powers Midjourney and some of the other um, image generators. Um, Bloomberg did an analysis that if you put in the term inmate, those are the distribution of skin tones that you would find for the results that it returns. Drug dealer, you see, and terrorist. Um, in terms of uh, returning someone who does a certain job, right, here's the racial breakdown, or the skin tone breakdown, rather, of the higher paying occupations like architect, primarily lighter skin, um, down to fast food worker and social worker, primarily darker skin tones. And I'm not saying that AI is creating bias, right? But it is reflecting the bias that is already present in our experience and that experience as it's reflected on the content, in the content we put on the web, right? And so it's perpetuating that bias and those stereotypes. Um, I thought this was funny as I was researching, um, AI has a hotness problem. This is also a racial problem right here, which is that attractive people are um, young and light-skinned, right? But furthermore, um, and okay, so I wanna make sure I say this the way I wanna say it. Um, so because AI is returning an average of what we put out there, um, Note that a lot of what we put out there is largely edited and prioritize attractiveness, prioritizes attractiveness. So um, every advertisement, right, is going to feature attractive people. But even when you set aside that, even the pictures we post of ourselves, right, I am not putting up the bad pictures of myself online, right? I am putting up the best case scenario. And so even of quote, normal people, we are skewing the AI algorithm to think that we are generally more attractive. It's gonna keep putting back attractive images and potentially exacerbate, um, uh, you know, this sort of like beauty problem, right? This um, body dysmorphia or other things, okay? In fact, this is Adobe Firefly. The prompt was photo of an ugly person. Like, that's not fair, right? Like, okay. Um, so, and definitely different engines give out different things. So the same prompt loaded into Midjourney might return someone who's almost like, uh, one article said a killer clown was returned. Like, well, we don't, we think this isn't hot. It's like, okay, well, great. Um, and of course, AI is being critiqued for the creation and dissemination of misinformation. Um, these are examples of both sides of the Israeli-Palestinian war using fake images created by AI to, su to create support for their cause. And unfortunately, what happens, I mean, that's already unfortunate, but even more unfortunately, is that it also leads to claims that real images are indeed AI fakes. Um, and it, discredits um, authentic and factual images. And some of them you look at them and you're like, oh, I would know that that's a fake, right? Um, but think about the, uh, the rapidity of things being put out into social media and how things go viral, right? It's those attention-grabbing images that you may think you know are fake, but does everyone, right? So finally, and most relevantly to this talk, AI is also facing a serious copyright problem. In the United States, a federal judge ruled in August that AI artwork cannot meet federal copyright standards because, quote, copyright is limited to the original intellectual conceptions of the author. So they say that there's no author, so there's no copyright. And you might already start thinking like, but someone put in the prompt, right? Or someone chose or someone reiterated. So Hold on to that. Um, but furthermore, many cases have been filed against AI companies over how they use copyrighted content to train their models. So authors, comedians, actors, and visual artists have all filed lawsuits against companies including Microsoft, Meta, and OpenAI, alleging that such unauthorized use by the fast-growing industry 
amounts to a massive violation of copyright law. So just last week, a federal judge allowed a class action suit filed by several artists to move forward on this core allegation, which is stability, which powers Midjourney and others, built its tools by exploiting vast numbers of copyrighted works. So those closed data sets, right, that, that they're not sharing where that information came from, these artists are saying, my work was part of that data set without my permission, and that is a copyright infringement. <clears throat> so the judge, though, did cast doubt on another allegation that was part of that suit. Um, and that allegation was that every output image produced by Stable Diffusion would itself be copyright infringing, would be a derivative of the images that were used to train the model. And so that dramatically limited the impact of the lawsuit. Um, but beyond copyright, what central questions, I mean, there are central questions that remain about what it means to be an artist, right? The idea that about that something is made is just as important Excuse me. There is something about creation and learning that should be long and hard and messy, right? In order for it to have any sort of real transformative effect on the person who's doing it. Maybe you agree, maybe you don't, right? Writing a prompt is maybe more about curation than, about, than creation, right? The gap between thinking and making is not always a quick problem to be solved. So there are artistic virtues to be learned in that gap, right? Patience and craftsmanship, persistence, discipline, awareness, and wonder. Isn't the struggle a key part of the creative process? Um, is averaging billions of options the same as flexing the creative muscle? You know, I've seen in my students um, that every brainstorming task begins with a Google search, and not just them, for me too. Um, it has become a stand-in for thinking or at least at the first, right? Um, so we want to make sure that we're providing space to not just create, but to think, okay? And for that thinking to inform the creativity. Um, the other question I have is, what is the relationship between artificial intelligence and authenticity? In April, Levi's announced that it is testing AI-generated clothing models to, quote, increase diversity. What is the value of diversity if it is artificially generated? And as you can imagine, they have since started walking back that statement that this would not um, take the place of diverse modeling models, but would augment. Uh, Imad Mostik is the CEO and creator of Stability AI. Um, and he has said, my message to artists would be, quote, Illustration jobs are very tedious. It's not about being artistic. You are a tool. In his view, the craft is an obstacle to be overcome, and it's only the concept that matters. Now, you might think, wow, the artists are, have no choice but to be victims. But there are um, some people who are trying to create things to fight back. So researchers at the University of Chicago have developed a technique that artists can use to embed invisible poison in their work. Um, the tool is called Nightshade, and it changes an image's pixels in a way that humans can't detect. Um, so computers, though, do notice those changes, which are carefully designed to impair AI models' ability to label their images. If an AI model is trained on these kinds of images, the abilities will, its abilities will begin to break down. It will, for example, um, learn that cars are cows, or that cartoon art is impressionism. They, they went through this whole process um, as they were testing Nightshade, and they convinced it that um, little by little, as they fed these pixels, these invisible pixels, that they could ask for a picture of a dog and it would return a picture of a cat. So it was breaking the AI. So you might be wondering at this point how I can turn around and use AI um, knowing what I now know, which to be fair, I didn't quite fully know when I started using it. Um, and I think the answer is that it's here no matter what I think about it. Um, 
And so Stephen Heller is a prolific graphic design writer and thinker, and he wrote a piece a couple of weeks ago that I would like to briefly read to you if you'll indulge me. He says, AI is going through its Wild West stage, and well, now's the time to be fearless, knowledgeable, and use AI for designers' creative needs, letting the software work for us rather than us for it. Let's fight for the right to be in charge. And so then he gets really folksy, okay? He says, some folks are afraid that before too long, a stampede of AI-produced images will ravage and pillage our field. Are we ready to surrender? Will designers like the buffalo be decimated by marauding bandits of media moguls who want to replace design thinking with the aggregation of tried and true formulae that reduce creativity to a series of algorithms? No, no. Artificial intelligence can be a force for good or bad, depending on how it is used. It offers visionaries an opportunity to open new frontiers to explore territories that have only been imagined. It should not be allowed to lay claim to any expanse where designers freely roam. When Photoshop was introduced, some smart yet short-sighted folks mourned the loss of brain and handwork that had defined the field for 100 plus years. But quickly, the software was trained, tamed, and put to use as the designer's most valuable tool. The same concerns about AI are being bandied about not that there are not red flags. Threats galore about the dangers of stolen IP, false truth, and invented reality. But false has been true for ages. AI has dangers built into it, but we must be prepared for them, and certain it cannot come a trespassing onto our range, causing a ruckus, or ravage and ruin. AI needs domesticating, and now's the time to do it, and pronto. Very young. <laughs> feel jaunty. That was great. Okay. Um, so all of this has um, coalesced into this new body of work that is here in the Project Space Gallery called Simulacrum, which is from the Latin meaning likeness or semblance. Um, and it's a representation of a person or thing, but it has this secondary association of inferiority, right? An image without the substance or qualities of the original. So I used AI to create posters in the style of famous designers to, uh, and, and then doing it through that iterative mode of screen printing to uh, pose questions about authenticity, originality, authorship, and playing on that tension between the physical and the digital. Um, and here are some images from that. Right, so while the subject of the, the works, right, is you know, the style of these designers, it's artificial intelligence, this exhibit is really also just about me learning something new, right? And when I go in there and I see, and I hesitate to say this because I don't want you all looking too, but when I look at it, I see like the mistakes. I see where I am a novice in printing and that caused the registration to be a little bit off or that one little mark that I forgot to block out with an emulsion pen or what have you. And so, that exhibit is as much about learning that craft as it is about the, the AI-generated images. And so I, I like to be vulnerable in that way because I think it shows for my students that they can learn new things and be not start bad, right? And then get a little bit better and then put in the time and get a little bit better and get a little bit better which is a weird tension to be in with this AI where it's instantaneous, okay? And I, I find that interesting. Um, so here are just some images from the gallery. And then for the sake of screen real estate and to not be like going in, I just smushed two together, which is not intentional to draw necessarily parallels between these or contrasts, but some of them are kind of fun to look at. Um, so the first one over here we have um, in the style of, and so let me back up. You use Midjourney through a server called, through a platform called Discord, and you invite the Midjourney bot to be on your server, and then you give the bot instructions. And so you say forward slash imagine, and then it says prompt, and you say, well, in the style, and so I wrote, simple flat color illustration, because I'm trying to screen print this, 
um, in the style of, and I gave the designer name, and then what I found was that AI was really not very good at simulating these designers a lot of the time. And so I then started feeding in a sample image that was typical of the style of that designer. So now I have this um, moral, ethical dilemma where I am training the AI to be smarter and better at this. Uh, so that's, there's that. I get to wrestle with that. That's nice. Um, and so in the style of Milton Glaser, this is his famous poster of Bob Dylan. Um, and so you can see where it's pulling out some of the, the similarities. Um, but I am making a lot of decisions as like mid journey or discord gives me back this, a series, a, actually a, a grid of four images. I'm choosing one, or I might say, give me variations of that one. And then I'm telling it to upscale that. And then I'm saving that and opening it up into Photoshop or Illustrator. Um, and I am making edits so that it is possible for me to screen print it, right? That um, I could do three colors here, but to get the, what, eight colors that are um, on this um, Bob Dylan poster, I, I have neither the screens nor the time nor the expertise. So I'm making decisions, authorship decisions. And so um, instead of that many colors, I have three. Um, over here, we have Paula Cher that we've talked about with her constructivism and the dynamic text. And so what I think is really interesting is AI is super bad at text. Um, and, less, and even when you tell it exactly what words to use, but if it's just generating text, it's nonsense, right? And sometimes not even actual letters. They're letter-like, but they're not letters. Um, here we have Art Chantry, who has uh, done a lot of work in the Seattle grunge scene, right? Lots of um, album covers and posters. And he uses a lot of uh, found imagery that he's appropriating um, and layering in this sort of collage style. Uh, the, the, someone said, what was it, Alyssa? The, it looked like Dr. Seuss's fish had a baby with the Grinch. <laughs> um, which is better when, it, when the actual image that was um, generated had like, I mean, dozens of things, and I just couldn't. So we got rid of the things. Um, that maybe that hurts the authenticity of the process, but here we are. Um, and then on the right here, we have David Carson, who, um, <clears throat> you know, it was the 1990s, and this whole computer desktop um, publishing revolution, and people were like, design's gonna be super sterile and boring, because we're all doing it the same way on the computer. And he was like, absolutely not. Um, in that digital realm, he did all this sort of layering and um, playing with how legible text can be or doesn't have to be. Um, and he actually published in Ray Gun Magazine an entire article in Dingbats. Yeah. <laughs> it's completely illegible, right? No one can read that. He was like, here's some content. Okay. Um, so this is David Carson in the 90s grunge. And then again, we have Alphonse Mucha again. Um, and we see actually AI did like a really, I think, serviceable job creating something that looks like his work. Now again, the text is just nonsense. Um, but I, on this one, I decided a split fountain was the way to get color without trying to replicate all of the colors. Um, over here we have Luba Lukova, who is a New York-based um, illustrator and designer, and her work is very much about social justice and activism. And so I fed this image in, and I did, and again, some of them as I was trying to get at, like, how smart could it be? This one I said, social justice poster in the style of Luba Lukova. And so you can see some of those themes, right, with the scale, but um, AI is notoriously terrible at hands. Human hands and feet completely flummox it. And so you see we've got a wing emerging <laughs> out of that right hand. Um, which I'm sure we could make up some meaning for that would be very um, meaningful and noble. But um, Then we have Saul Bass, who's no most known for his poster design work for Hitchcock films, as well as opening title se sequences for those movies. Um, and so, you know, we get 
the sort of cutout effect, right? So the way Saul Bass made those is that he was actually literally cutting out pieces of construction paper and putting those together. And so we get that sort of effect, but without the kind of like interesting concept underlying it, right? So with vertigo, we have the, the swirl or man with the golden arm, right? There, it's just, in my view, maybe a little bit empty. And then I come to the question of, I'm seeing this emptiness, is that on the AI or is that reflecting how well I am or am not writing the prompts, right? So how much of that is on me? Uh, Alexander Girard is a mid-century design, textile and furniture designer, worked with Charles and Ray Eames. Um, and so the AI was like, you want a son, you got it. <laughs> uh, Alexander Rodchenko, the Russian constructivist, uh, I fed in this image of the tank and it came back. But again, I used this time the term propaganda poster. So it's pulling um, kind of that fist imagery. Um, and then Aaron Douglas is a designer of the Harlem Renaissance. And so he used, um, addressed issues of segregation with Afrocentric images that drew on biblical imagery. And again, I think the AI got this sort of right almost, right? The pulling some very specific themes from the source imagery. I do think it's interesting, the rays, I kept noticing that in the, um, the images that were returned, there were lots of like suns silhouetted, like things that we are drawn to as being kind of dramatic images. Um, so I thought that was an interesting theme I was seeing. Um, this is George Olden, an African-American designer who worked for CBS in the 1950s and 60s, and he did title designs for I Love Lucy and Lassie and others. And most of his images don't have any figures in them whatsoever, right? These are um, ads that come up on the TV screen or little uh, title designs. Um, but the AI was like, no, I love people, right? And you see it here in the Marimekko, right? The Finnish design textile company. Um, I fed in an image and in the style of Marimekko, it's mostly textiles. There aren't figures in this, but AI is like, you people like people. <laughs> you like seeing pictures of yourself. I'm gonna put um, figures in there. But again, you can see where it's pulling like, oh, kind of a flat design with the um, strings coming down from the, the tag image and then the poppies um, pulling from Marimekko. And then finally, we have uh, Wes Wilson with his psychedelic poster design. Um, I thought it was funny that for most of the Wes Wilson images I was generating in AI, it kept wanting to put guitars in there. Guys, Wes Wilson never put guitars in his posters that I could see in his catalog. Um, but the AI knew that he did concert posters and they were like, ah, concert imagery. This is a, a, you know, an instrument that we should put in. And so there we've got um, at least the, the least guitar guitar that I, that I found. Um, and then over here we have Paul Rand, who um, was again a mid-century mid designer. He did uh, identity design for IBM, ABC, logos for all of those companies, um, and really adopted the sort of Swiss design um, in the U.S. I think we have like a couple of minutes. So do you guys want to try doing it real time? Okay. Oh, no, nope, that's the wrong thing. That was a, in case this didn't work, I have a video of it, okay. <laughs> Oh, see, there's our friend with the fangs, right? Way more disturbing. Okay. So um, does anyone want to try either a famous designer or artist? So I'm saying imagine down here. So typing. Okay. Perfect. In the style of Andy Warhol. So it's saying waiting to start. And then in a second, you'll see that a grid pops up. It's going to have four options, and it's going to like slowly generate almost like layers. It's interesting. It has lots of data. This is going way faster. Or maybe sitting your Wi-Fi is killing it. Yeah. All right, so then we've got this is one option. This is another. Here's another. 
and here's a fourth option. So maybe I'm liking this, so I can say show me more versions of, it's numbered one, two, three, four. I can say show me more of three. Try, yes, I want to do it again. So remix the prompt. Might also be interesting to do a person, specific person maybe. And so then you can click on this um, and see them closer up. And I can say, I really maybe like this first one, so I want to upscale the first one. And now it's going back to doing that. And the latest version of MidJourney um, has an even better upscaler. That is, the images can get even bigger than um, originally in the last version. So if I open in browser, you can see that this is a pretty high quality image, right, fit for print. So I don't know if you're going yay or ugh, right? But if you're me, you're experiencing both of those things simultaneously, right? Like, I really want to play with this. This is really cool. And also, like, what are the implications of this? And what are the unforeseen, um, you know, consequences that we, we just have no way of knowing right now. Um, that seems like a really terrible place to end, except I do want to say I'm so grateful that you guys are, are here, and I hope, what I hope is that not just feeling like dread and chaos, is that you feel better equipped to engage this discussion, right, and, and enter into that with a, a little bit of grounding now. And that's it. That's all I have. All right. Do y'all have any questions? Yeah, I mean, I wonder if so, because I think when people are putting in, like, they're using Midjourney to, again, those hyper-realistic, surreal images, and a lot of it is drawn from, like, video game imagery, and so there are these big dramatic moments of, like, going on a journey or ascending a mountain, right, that has that sort of vista. Um, so yeah, I would say that it has, it's kind of like that design equivalent or illustration equivalent of, you know, returning people or always returning kind of these same tropes over and over again. And it's pulling from that really dramatic imagery that we're seeing and a lot of the video game art is very big in that data set, I guess. And people are using it to generate more of that. Yeah. Great question. So you can use it for free, but it limits the number of prompts, like the number of images generated. So for a set amount of time, I am paying for an increased volume. Um, and it also means that it generates the images faster, right? So it might take a little more time for the mid-journey mid bot to respond to you if you are using a free version. But mid-journey is just one. There's Dolly 2 is another one or now Dolly 3, actually. Um, you know, Google has their own version. Um, Adobe has their own version. There are vector ones now. So these are raster-based images that are made up of pixels. Um, vector-based ones are ones that are infinitely scalable and oftentimes layered. So they're actually truly useful design files for some, if someone wants to pick it apart and um, edit it from there. Yeah. So I probably misunderstood your answer to Dr. Yeah. Maybe not. Uh, are there different, so you, you just answered about how that particular uh, engine mm -hmm. draws on video game art and so forth and so on. Would there be a different database that would, for example, draw on the collective works of the Metropolitan and the mm -hmm. Tate and would, would bring back very classical imagery? Great question. And I think there aren't separate generators for that. 
but there are libraries of prompts. So there are libraries that tell you how to write better prompts and saying, if you want to um, deliver something in this style, let's say in the style of Degas, right, or in the style of Monet, um, not only using those names, but then using that specific terminology for that type of painting, but even further talking about um, perspectives, right, um, how zoomed in versus zoomed out, that you can get very specific and get something that doesn't look like video game art. But I think what we're seeing is that if you don't specify those extra parameters, that's what it's tending toward. Yeah. I'm going to go here and then to Lauren. Yeah, great question. So I have thought about using it for concepts, right? If I'm brainstorming and I'm trying to think about what are different ways to, convey, to combine these things, um, you know, I, I could see using AI in that, not to generate finished work for a client, but as a way, as a, like a quick sketchbook, um, which kind of turns it on its head, right? Because most people are trying to use it like, this is my finished product. And I'm thinking, what if this rapid iteration could help me think through my visual ideas faster and choose something to then pour my efforts into? Did that answer your question? OK. Um, that again, I just again, images created with this are, are not copyrightable, at least right now. So I wouldn't suggest that artists use it as like a primary mode of making if you're wanting to retain that, um, those rights. Mm -hmm. How are you balancing this new tool with the idea of process? So obviously, if you, to get what you want, yeah. you have to edit what it provides. Yeah. And when it came out with layers, the illustrator almost fell out. I had a bad day. <laughs> yeah. like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah, because before you were like, I can tell, yeah, right? I can tell if you did this. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, how do you impress upon the importance of process when you have an ability to get answers that are good enough? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, and I don't have a great answer for you. Um, I, but I, what's interesting is I'm about to give that designer homage poster assignment. I'm assigning it like next class period. Right. And so I'm like, am I just giving every one of my students like an easy way to like make an A on this assignment? And I think what I would say is that it's the same result that you're gonna get when you use the first page of search results on Google to give an answer. You're going to get the same answer that everyone else gets, and it's this homogenization of information. And I think the same is true with AI. Like, we're averaging all these data points. We're getting a homogenization, an average. And I just, like, when I ask my students, I'm like, do you want your work to be an average, right? Or do you want something that is, you know, unique or singular, right? Yeah, fully. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, I, something that struck me as you were talking about your process was, you know, you turn to this AI-generated stuff at first because you needed to pick up the skill of screen, screen printing quickly. Correct. Yeah. Um, and that was the goal more than the conversation that we've had. Yeah. AI, right. It's like picking up the skill, learning the technique. Right. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And then also, like, what this sort of like AI-driven crash course, right, might make possible for you. Yeah. When you're generating ideas on your own, and then taking the skills you've learned and picked up through this exercise. Right. And deploying them for your own work. I mean, I think. Not that this is an interesting. Yeah. No. 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 So, like, the the certainly the learning the technical aspects of like how dense the, the bitmap image needs to be to 
um, get through the mesh of the screen, right? Something that looked like it had a full tonal range when I printed it out on a film positive, when I burned it, I would lose like everything above 50% gray. And I was like, am I just not exposing this correctly? That was part of it. Um, or do I need to make those uh, film positives much, much, much darker to achieve the effect that I want? And so it was a combination of those two things. So um, I think particularly uh, printing things that had a tonal range versus just flat color helped me really wrestle <laughs> with that process, which it was a wrestling. Um, and so, and I'm trying, so I think I got some of the first part of your question. Yeah, right. yeah. And like, they're, they're working one day at one artist and another mm -hmm. day at another artist. Mm -hmm. They're still always working mm -hmm. on their own skill. Yep. Right? And so I'm curious about like, sort of the, like, the range of skill and then what you might make yeah. of that. No, I, th I think that's a great, a great point because I, when I am working on my own design projects, I am more than I realize influenced by what I've been looking at, right? So. Um, if there's a particular style that is really, um, like if you go to creativemarket.com or even just looking on Canva, right, there is a similar kind of approach or design aesthetic, even though the, there's some parts that are different. You can see these. And so if that's all I've seen, then that's what I naturally start to make. And so by widening kind of that, <laughs> my own personal data set, right, of images that I'm consuming, I'm going to get more varied results out. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Listen, thank you guys so much for your time. I'm happy to talk to anyone um, afterwards who wants to keep talking, but I also appreciate the, especially the small children who have done such a lovely um, job um, holding still. So thank you all so much for coming.